Okay, today we're going to go over Parashat Vayet Hanan. In Parashat Vayet Hanan, there's quite a few emphasis, very important emphasis that the Torah puts in various areas. Uh, we're going to begin from the, from the start. Vayet Hanan, Moshe pleads, Moshe begs with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, allow me to enter Eretz Israel, allow me to see the Ma'alot of Eretz Israel. It's not just a, uh, a tour, it's not just to see the land, the beauty of the land, but the various, the many Ma'alot, the many characteristics, special characteristics that this land has, the uniqueness of this land. And the only way you can see them is by being there, by walking. Dalet Amot, as the rabbis saying, as the rabbis tell us in Eretz Israel, when you walk there, when you live there, you can actually experience and feel the uniqueness of Eretz Israel. That it's, no, it's like no other land in the world. Moshe wants to feel that. Moshe wants to fulfill the mitzvot that are tied to this land. And that is why he's asking Hashem permission to enter. Hashem has told him that you will not enter the land. Nevertheless, Moshe pleads with Hashem. By Hanan means that he pleads, he begs 515 times. 515 prayers were said to give him a chance to enter the land of Eretz Israel, to experience the ma'alot, the uniqueness, the unique ha- character of Eretz Israel. It's interesting that Moshe makes a big deal about it, but not everyone who visits the land notices or is impressed. People go there, they tour, they see it, maybe they go back one more time, but not everybody really knows the true value of Eretz Israel. And in order to appreciate the true value of Eretz Israel, one would have, have to first understand what Eretz Israel is all about, what Am Israel is all about, what the connection between the two are, and then actually go there and live there for a while to see how the two go together. But unfortunately, even those who are living there today, many of them do not know the true value of Eretz Israel. They do not appreciate what they have. They treat it as another piece of land, but it's not just another piece of land. An important point that the commentaries tell us that we learn from this begging of Moshe is that even if one is under the guillotine, a sword is about to come down and chop his head off, one should never give up hope. One should always continue to pray, regardless of his situation. He's not doing very well in his parnasah. He can't find a good job. He is getting older and older, and he, has, he or she has not found their soulmate. This could be very uh, painful, and many people give up hope. Don't give up hope. One can always ask Hashem for mercy. Why mercy? Because if, Halila, there is a terrible gezera, uh, terrible decree, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, through Midat HaRachamim, can cancel the decrees. That is why we have something called tefillah. Tefillah, tshuva, tzedakah, these three, repentance, charity, and prayer, are capable of annulling even the most terrible decrees. That is why they were given it to us. They were given to us because we can use them. Hashem knows what's best for us, but sometimes He wants us to pray to Him. He wants us to ask Him, and we should therefore never give up hope. It could just be through an additional prayer, an additional prayer, we would be able to, with that Hashem, awaken HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Rachamim and us. Moshe, by putting an emphasis on entering Eretz Israel, is also, Moshe Rabbeinu, by asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu to enter the land of Eretz Israel, is letting us know that his request is a very important request. What's the big deal? So you don't see Eretz Israel. No, there's something very important about Eretz Israel. The whole Goral of Am Israel is tied to the Goral of Eretz Israel. The whole fate, the destiny of the Jewish people is tied to the destiny of this land. The two are connected. That is why there are several efforts made here by Moshe to enter this land. We're talking about something which is connectly, connected directly to Am Israel. And I'd like to emphasize this for a moment. What do we mean by connected? Many of you who read recent history recall the fact that there were some Jews that would have been very, very happy had they been given Uganda as a country for Jews. The Pampas of Argentina was another area that was offered. And some Jews seriously considered that all they wanted to do is get away from the ghettos of Europe, from the persecution, from the hatred. But obviously, for us, all of that is galut. All of that is the diaspora. We only have one land that belongs to us, and that is Eretz Israel. No other land will satisfy us. The idea is not just to get away from the trouble, because if Hazrashalom trouble is meant to happen, it's going to happen wherever you are, even in Eretz Israel. But there's a special connection between the Jewish people and Eretz Israel. The Goral, the fate, the destiny of Eretz Israel is tied to the fate and destiny of Am Israel. That is why there's an emphasis here by Moshe to try to get in to show a connection between the two. This connection between Eretz Israel and Am Israel is seen through the mitzvot. If Am Israel would fulfill the mitzvot, we would still be there. If we do not fulfill the mitzvot, we're kicked out. Somehow, as I will explain later on, the connection is tied 
or is made through the mitzvot of the commandment. Another area of importance in this parasha, a very important parasha, and I don't mean to take away from other parashiyot, but as I've explained, I believe, last week, Sefer Devarim is a repetition of many mitzvot, but these are also the last words of Moshe. Everybody knows that he's about to depart from this world. He gives us Musar, he speaks to us very seriously, last pieces of advice, and it's important to pay attention to what he has to say, because this is not only to that generation, all that is being said is to future generations. So Parashat Vayet Hanan, is a, as you will see why, is a very important parasha, for, especially for beginners who want to understand what Judaism is all about. It's an important parasha to learn, because in Parashat Vayet Hanan you will find an emphasis on not who is a Jew, but what is it. You may have heard the question in the Knesset, in recent Israeli politics, Miu Yehudi, who is a Jew? We have to determine, we have to finally figure out what makes a Jew a Jew. But to us that's simple, that's not a question. If the mother is Jewish, the gentleman is Jewish, the woman is Jewish. What's the big deal? The real question should be asked, Maze Yehudi, not, what is a, not who is a Jew. That we can figure out. What is a Jew is a more difficult question. What makes a Jew Jewish, other than being biologically Jewish because his mother was Jewish? So if you want to know what makes a Jew Jewish, what's so unique about being Jewish, what's so unique about Judaism, that you will find in Parashat Vayet Hanan. So let me point out several points that you will find in Parashat Vayet Hanan that describe the uniqueness of Am Israel. One is Kivanu Bachar Liyoto Le'am Segula. We were chosen as a unique nation. In other words, there are many nations in the world that Hashem created all of them. But Banu Bachar, he chose us to be an Am Segula. What is an Am Segula? Segula can be translated as a treasure, something that is important, to you, something that's very, very special to you, that you put away in your safe. Am Segula, therefore, describes that Am Israel is not like no other nation in the world. It has a special mission. It means a lot to our Kadosh Baruch Hu, what they do, how they behave, and so forth. All of that is in the words Am Segula. So Am Israel is a unique nation, not a favorite nation, as some non-Jews claim that we are saying we are. We're not a favorite nation. If he chose us, it's not because we're better. It's not because we're, more, we're greater in numbers, as the Torah says. We're the smallest one. So there's nothing better about us. We're not necessarily smarter. We're not necessarily better. Hashem chose us because we're a holy nation, because of our commitment, because of what our forefathers did, to become an Amsegula. And when he chose us, he chose us for a mission. He gave us a responsibility. So it's not favoritism here. It's responsibility. Second point that the Torah emphasizes, the uniqueness of Judaism as a religion, is shalna leyamim. Kishalna leyamim rishonim hashayu lefanecha. Just ask around. Ask any nation in the world. Hashayu lefanecha that were before you. Lemina yom ha-shebalai lo'im adam al-aretz. From when Hashem created man on this earth, ul mekzea shamayim, on all corners, ve'at kzea shamayim. Haniya kadavara gadol azeo anishma kamo. Have you ever heard of something like this? Has there been any nation in the world, any religion that was formed, like Judaism was formed, where the entire nation, millions of people, heard the word of Hashem directly? All the religions in the world, all the faiths, it's one individual or a committee that said, God appeared to us in a dream. Why should we believe you? Am Israel, every one of us, every one of us witnessed it. We all saw it. We all heard it. Otherwise, we, a stubborn nation, would we believe Moshe telling us these stories? You saw this, you witnessed that, you experienced that. Remember Egypt? Remember the Makot? Mapitom. What are you talking about? They would, they would have accepted all these mitzvot had they not heard, had they not seen. That is the uniqueness of Judaism that no other religion, and the Torah says you can ask any religion in the world. The Torah says ask, just ask anybody in the world. Look at all the history books from the past and from the future. You will never find a group, a religion, a people that will claim what we claim, that Hashem appeared to all of us. That's unique only to Judaism. Another idea is Shomer HaBrit Chesed. Judaism is a contract. There is a Brit involved, a covenant between us and Hashem. There was a Chupa, Matan Torah. There was a Kiddushin. And there is a Ketuva, a marriage contract, which is the Torah. It's not just a friendship. There is a lot more responsibilities involved when we're dealing with a husband and wife, other than just a union between them. There is a very important alliance here between the two, a very important kesher between And that kesher is made through the ketuvah, through the Torah. Very, very different than all the other religions in the world. We have a kesher, we're am segula, and we witness this happen before our own eyes. That's a brief description of the uniqueness of Am Yisrael as a people and as a religion. Now let's go over to another area of emphasis, the potential of every Jew. 
In this week's parasha, Moshe makes a point of Vatema Devekim, Vashem Chaim Kulechem Hayom. And you attach yourself to the Almighty, and you will live forever. What is this attachment all about? One idea behind this attachment is that the Torah is telling us, Moshe is not the only one that is attached to God and close to God. Every Jew has the potential to come close to God. There were many, many prophets, even though they were not on the level of Moshe. Nevertheless, everyone has the potential to grow and to be very, very close to Hashem. As it is mentioned, it is brought down in Tanat Ve'eliyahu. Eliyahu Navi says, Nishbani, I swear, Ben Ish Ben Isha, whether it's a man or a woman, Ben Goy, Ben Yehudi, whether it's a Jew or non-Jew, Depending according to his deeds, he can attain the level of Ruach HaKodesh, which means uh, the Holy Spirit, if you can call it that. Divine inspiration is a better translation. Depending on his deeds, anyone, a man or a woman, a Jew or a non-Jew, anyone can become attached and be close to Hashem. A second idea of why Moshe is telling us that you, could, you should be attached to the Almighty is because Moshe saw the future. And what did he see in the future? That Am Yisrael will become attached to many idols and many vanities in the world. And he's emphasizing to us, Only if you attach yourself to the Almighty will you live, will you survive. In other words, your survival depends on this attachment and this relationship with Hashem. This is, of course, a very important message when it comes to Chinuch Yiladim, to educating one's children. You want them to survive as Jews, you want them to be continuously attached to the Torah, to Jewish values, which they can only get in a Jewish school, not in the public school. You want to be attached to the Almighty, you want to survive, you want to, you want to stay for eternity, then you continue to give over this education, this tradition, to the future generations, to your children. Another idea of Atema Devekim is what the Gra says, the Gaon Vilna says, that our greatest enemy is the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav are the multitudes of the nations that joined us in Egypt, and they're still around with us. They never meant to convert sincerely, they only did it because they had an interest, and they are our biggest enemy number one. Why are they our biggest enemies? Because here you have Jews, not non-Jews, who deny everything. And it's worse to have an enemy within than from the outside. So the Grad, Gaon of Vilna says as follows, Moshe, in reviewing the Torah and going over the mitzvot, he's reminding all of Am Yisrael, who will be faced with the danger from the Erev Rav, who will try to deny everything. Am Yisrael, he tells them, defend yourself. Remember that these mitzvot are for eternity. Nobody can make any changes here. Remember that the mitzvot are the ikar, they are the most important part of the Torah. It's not having a good heart like some people claim. I have a good heart, that is sufficient. That the mitzvot are the ikar, and that they are forever. And one more point, remember that the enemy will eventually be destroyed. That you who are attached, you will survive. So Moshe is letting us know that in the very, very end, that enemy, the source of all trouble, the one who tries to deny everything, will be destroyed. Those who attach themselves will be the only ones to survive for eternity. Now that we've uh, discussed the importance of being attached, we have to know how to go about it. So the Torah in Parashat Vayet Hanan tells us how to attach ourselves to Hashem. We say it every day. This is the way you attach yourself. You should love Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your possession. The rabbis have various interpretations of each one of these three. They tell us, for example, means with the two yetzarim, with your evil inclination, with your good inclination. They tell us even if they make you give up your life. But I'd like to add an, an additional explanation to each one of these three. With the two, we only have one heart. So what does it mean with all your heart, with all your hearts? There are individuals who are uh, very, very religious, very observant, make a good impression in public. But at home, when they are by themselves, they commit a lot of sins. They're hypocrites. They're hypocrites, I guess we can call them. And the rabbis tell us, One should always be careful that he should be God-fearing as much as he's outside. As much as he is outside, he should be as God-fearing inside, where nobody sees. So some people have a difficult time. They want to make a good impression, of course, and they do their best to pray long, to shake a lot, and perhaps they grow a long beard, and perhaps they do other things to make an impression that they're God-fearing. But deep inside, they know themselves that they're far from being God-fearing. V'chole v'avecha means in all situations, wherever you may be, love Hashem truly, not just to impress others, not only in public, but also in private. V'chol nafshecha, with all your soul, what does that mean? Well, some people love God only when things are going well for them. They're making a lot of money, 
The IRS didn't catch them this year, so they're thank you know, you know, in Israel, if you score a goal, all of a sudden you hear the player saying, Yesh Elohim! Before the goal was scored, Halila there wasn't. Now that they go, they score the goal, Yesh Elohim! All of a sudden, God exists. Bechol Matzav, Bechol Nafshecha means no matter what your economic situation is, it could be very challenging. Imagine somebody being sent to prison, and he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't, he didn't do anything wrong. They are accusing him of something, and I'm sure you've heard many such stories. People were in jail for 20 years. Now, we're talking about non-Jew in jail. Jews were in jail for all sorts of reasons. But if the guy knows that he didn't do anything wrong, this is a big challenge to his faith. He has children at home, a wife. What is he supposed to think? Many people, Holocaust survivor, had this problem. Where is Hashem? Big test to their emunah, to their faith. A faith that they didn't really question so much at home. All of a sudden they're questioning. We're not going to get into the whys, why they question. That's a whole topic in itself, the Holocaust. Even though we'll cover perhaps some points in Parashat Vayetana, nevertheless, uh, a person's emunah can be shattered. If it's not strong enough, it's challenged. And one area of challenge is economics. What am I gonna, how am I going to feed my family? They're making me work on Shabbat. Or some other situation where he's being challenged to eat non-kosher food because he's in the road. Well. I'm in uh, Eureka, California, and there is no uh, kosher restaurant. Well, that's no excuse. Just go into any 7-Eleven or, or any supermarket, and you'll find enough kosher food, even though there may be snacks, but enough, en enough food to survive. No excuses. Yeah, but I have to have a hot meal. That's what, that's what one guy told me. A hot meal. The emunah, his emunah is being tested. He's being challenged. I told him, next time, pack yourself some sandwiches. Take a microwave if you need to. But uh, don't allow your yetzer to defeat you in the road. Bechol nafshecha, therefore, means in every situation that you may be, regardless of how well you're doing, stay strong. Bechol meodecha, even if it costs you money. Now, that's very, very hard for some people. It's not easy and it's not cheap to be Jewish. <laughs> Jewish education is expensive. It's free in public school. Bechol meodecha means with all your money, even if it costs you money. That is how you show your love for Hashem. If you really care about something, you pay for it. Rabbi tells in the you really like someone, you really care about someone, then you do almost anything for them, even if it costs you money. What's money? The friendship is much more important. It's much more important than your sleep. It's much more important than your money. It's much more important than uh, whatever you have to go through. Knelecha, acquire. If you really want it, then you work hard on it. Ahavat Hashem should not be any less than a friendship. Bechol levavecha, bechol nafshecha, bechol meodecha can also be described in various periods in Jewish history. Bechol levavecha, there was a time in history where the Jews served Hashem with all their heart. The Avodat Hashem was very, very strong. There was a period in history where Bechol Nafshecha was very strong. They had to give their lives during the Inquisition. It was a time when their life was being challenged. And Bechol Meodecha is our time. This is the challenge of the 20th and 21st century, how we use or misuse our money. In other words, we can show Ahavat Hashem through money. 100, 200 years ago, most Jews at least the average Jew did not have as much money as the average Jew has today. The standard of living has risen, people are more comfortable, and how they spend their money is a challenge. Where do they put their money? In a car or in Jewish education or in some other mitzvah? Talk about people who have the money. How do you use your money? Do you give charity? Do you help others? This is the test and the challenge of this generation because Akalazba who wants to see Tzedakava Chesed in order to repair the Sinat Chinam, the baseless hatred can only be repaired through Avat Chinam, selfless love. One way of doing selfless love is by being charitable and kind. How you're charitable and kind? By helping people with your money. That is why Hashem made TWA, well, even though they're no longer around, but we have American Airlines, we had we had all these airlines that cut the distance from Eretz Israel from several months to several hours. It's incredible. It means that somebody who has to marry off a child in Israel cannot come and ask you for money in Los Angeles. A hundred years ago, I guarantee you, if anybody had to go through an operation, Anybody had to marry off his child, would he have traveled weeks and months? Do you know where the Baal Shem Tov lived? He lived in Ukraine. I think most of you know where the Ukraine is. Kiev? Yeah, he didn't live in Kiev. Most of you may have heard of other big tzaddikim who lived in Poland. And I think most of you have some knowledge of geography, where Poland is in relationship to Israel. Do you know how far Ukraine, the Ukraine is from Israel? Well, depends. 200 years ago, it was very far. Today, it's a three-hour flight. A three-hour flight, what used to take weeks and months, and it was dangerous. The Baal Shem Tov went, wanted to go to Israel. He only reached Istanbul, Turkey. And it took him a while till he got to Istanbul. There they told him in Hashemayim, you can't go to it. We won't let you go. There were several individuals, for some reason in Hashemayim, they did not allow them to go to it. So he went back. But anyway, just to get halfway to get to Istanbul was tremendous amount of, of effort involved in Sakanot and danger. It takes a three-hour flight. Everybody's going. 
Kiev, Uman, Moscow, Warsaw. How many people are going to Auschwitz every single day <laughs> to visit the camps? Just around the corner. It's a three and a half hour flight from it. What's the big deal? From Los Angeles to Israel, if there were a direct flight, you would, and there is a direct flight sometimes in the summer, it's 14 and a half, 15 hours. It's incredible. The Kabbalists have something called Kvitzat HaDerech. They have, there's a special amulet with the name, special names of God, that if you say them and you are pure, you can have a Kvitzat HaDerech, you can have the road jump for you. In other words, instead of taking you a half an hour to get from here to uh, Encino, you could do it in five minutes. How would you like that? Five minutes. That's called Kvitzat HaDerech. But I won't give you, I won't give you that amulet. I won't give you that shape. We need to be pure. That's called Kvitzat HaDerech, but today we have it anyway with airplanes. Boom. 15 hours across the ocean like birds. <laughs> Why? Hashem is making it possible for one Jew to meet another Jew, for one Jew to help another Jew, even though they're on opposite sides of the globe, because Hashem wants it to be Tzedakah Vahese today. That's just one of the reasons why we have airplanes, and I'm sure there are other reasons. The Haida adds another explanation of why money is called Me'od. Mechol Me'od means with all your money, even if it's expensive. Chida says as follows, there are many tavot, many people have all sorts of desires. What's the common denominator of all the desires? They just last a certain amount of time, and after you finish with them, you're no longer interested. I think many of you like chocolate here, right? How much chocolate can you have? After a while, you're full, right? So every tava has a time limit, has an amount that you, know, that you can consume, and after that amount is consumed, you're satisfied. There's only one tava that you're never satisfied, you always want more. Which one is that? Money, mula, kesef, masari, flus, dinero, genyek, whatever language, it's all the same. <laughs> huh? That's why kesef is called me'od. The Hida says, you're never happy, you're never satisfied, you always want more. They once asked John Paul Getty, you know, who was a billionaire, Mr. Getty, how much is enough? So he said, just a little bit more. Ahavat <laughs> Hashem, <laughs> very important mitzvah, but how do you go about loving Hashem? And there's a bigger question, how could the Torah command us to love Hashem? Love is something that either you have it or you don't. If the Torah commands you to have it, that's not called love. The Torah is forcing it, imposing it on us, then that's not love. Love is when you feel it yourself, when you want it on your own. Then why command it? It, it, it doesn't, doesn't fit the idea of love. So the Sefat Emet explains as follows. In reality, the Neshama, the Teva of the Neshama, the soul is inclined to love Hashem. It wants to cling to Hashem. It loves Hashem by its, by its nature if you only allow it to. The problem is that w there are many things that interfere with it, with that love. And that is why the Torah has to command us, focus on this love. This is a very important relationship. But the Neshama in reality, if you just let it, if you take away all those things that interfere with this love, it will automatically want it. And I'll, and I'll prove it to you. There are many Israelis who after they finish their service in the Israeli army, they buy a ticket to India or to Nepal, to the Far East. What are they looking for? Meaning in life. The neshama is asking for something. They are hungry, they are thirsty. The, the potential for love of, a, of, a, of the Almighty is there. It's just obscured. They don't see it, they don't know what it is. They're looking for something. So if we remove all the obstacles, the neshama will find its place. It will know where to go. I'm going to give you two segulot for Ahavat Hashem. Segula meaning an aid, a special aid that can help us with the love for Hashem. After all, Hashem we don't see. Those who we see, we can love perhaps, we can make a connection. But Hashem we do not see. So there are various segulot. One segula that the commentaries talk about is obviously paying attention to all that He gives you, provides for you, the health, your children, be thankful and grateful. That is a simple idea of how to reinforce one's emuna and one's Ahavat Hashem. But I'm going to give you a segula. The commentaries tell us that one of the most powerful sigulot for Ahavat Hashem is Ahavat Israel, to love another Jew. If you love your fellow Jew, that will eventually help you love Hashem too. Anybody who does not love his fellow Jew can never have true Ahavat Hashem. It's impossible. So if you ever see someone who dislikes a certain group in Jewry, I'm not talking about an individual who's a wicked man. I'm talking about a certain group, he doesn't like them, can, it's not possible for him to have true Ahavat Hashem because Hashem loves all Jews. They're all his children. If you love his children, you love him. Segula for Ahavat Hashem is to therefore cultivate this true love for another fellow Jew. Another segula for Ahavat Hashem is to remove all those... Everybody loves something. And it could be that these love interfere with Ahavat Hashem. As the Magid of Dubna says, there was once a uh, farmer who came to town to buy himself a silk suit. He wanted to treat himself with a beautiful silk suit. So he went to the tailor. And you know how farmers are dressed, with heavy coats and heavy garments. And, uh, and he comes to the tailor, and, and he asks the tailor to measure a suit on him. 
and uh, he's about to grab this man is about to grab on his own a uh, a silk suit that was standing there and the tailor says no 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 you can't just put it on you right now if you put it on you right now the way you are dressed it won't fit you he takes it and says yeah this thing doesn't fit no you're right you first have to remove what you're wearing and then put this on and then it will fit nicely the same thing the Magid of Dubna says Ahavat Hashem, in order to fit on us, in order for us to have us, we have to re first remove what's blocking all the other Ahavot. People are so excited about certain things in life, much more than the Torah, unfortunately. That interferes. My, one of my examples that unfortunately I've had to use is the Lakers game. You know, if there is a game, people may not come to the Shur Torah, because they're in love with that. They have to see that. They love that, unfortunately, more than they love the Shur of Torah. That's the message that they're sending. You can't have it both ways. If you really like it, then videotape it. Have somebody record it for you. Uh, what is that? Yes, that's right. Somebody, in, order for, in order for a Jew to have, pro, to have the proper Ahavat Hashem, he has to remove all other Ahavot in order that they should not interfere or disturb his Ahavat Hashem. The Torah also adds that this Ahava or Yir'aur, the fear of Hashem, is not something that you just, get, you just get overnight. It's something that one has to learn. As the Pasuk says, Asher Yilmedun, in order to fear Hashem, one has to learn it. You just don't decide one day, I want to fear Hashem. Hashem, I fear you. It's something that one has to learn. What does it mean to fear Hashem? What does it mean to love Hashem? What does He, what does he expect of us? When one learns about it, that is how one gets to these levels of Yir'ayin Ahava. But even those who have become very distant from Judaism, who don't know anything, tradition tells us, and it's also insinuated in the Torah, that they can easily come back. Because what happened in Matan Torah in Har Sinai, there was a kol gadol velo yosif. There was a very, very powerful sound that did not stop. What is the idea behind this powerful sound not stopping? That this sound, the sound of Matan Torah, reverberates and continues to be heard. The echoes of the first sounds of Har Sinai continue to be heard in all generations at all times. If one allows himself to hear, if one would allow himself to hear, he would hear the heavenly voice. That is why whoever looks in the Torah, Misha Bonen, whoever reflects on the words of the Torah, will eventually come to the same conclusion that his parents reached, that this is real, that this happened. But it may, he may have been deprived from it. He may not have received a Jewish education. He may have grown up in, in Russia during the communist era when there was no Jewish education. So it's not his fault in a sense. But were he to look in the Torah, he will eventually be able to see the light. He will be able, he will be able to eventually hear the same heavenly voice that we heard in Matan Torah. But the importance of learning Torah is also for another reason. In this week's parasha and in the next week's parasha, Sefer Devarim, you will find various parashiyot that contain the answers to the most difficult questions in Judaism. So studying Torah not only is a mitzvah, it's very important to us. It's our, not only our survival, in order for us to properly understand what we're doing, why we're doing it for, we need to know. By learning the Torah, we will be able to not know everything there is to know, but to be able to figure out some of the most difficult questions that there are. One of the most difficult questions is Maduat Sadiq Veralo Rasha Vatovlo. Why is it that the righteous suffer and that the wicked appear to be getting away with it? The answer, or part of the answer to this dilemma, to this very difficult question, is in this week's parasha. Le shalem le sonav le havidam. Hashem sometimes pays a Rasha, a wicked man, for the few mitzvot that he did in, this, in his lifetime in order to destroy him not to give him a share to the world to come. Le shalem le soneab le avidam, to pay his enemies to destroy them. Whereas with, a, with those who he loves, the tzaddikim, le'elef dor, to those that he loves, he will reward le'elef dor. What does le'elef dor mean for a thousand generations? For eternity, le'olam haba. The reward is waiting for them in olam haba. So a tzaddik may suffer, may have a difficult life in this world, only because Hashem wants to reserve the reward, the immense reward that is awaiting for him, Le'olam Abba. So the few Averot that he did, he has to pay for them in this lifetime. This is, a, this is something we don't understand, but part of the answer is in this week's parasha. Why? Why do these things happen? Just look at what the Torah says. Just as we will see in a couple weeks from now, why do holocausts occur? Why do tragedies occur? Part of those explanations, part of those answers are also in the Torah. We will never be able to fully understand everything. We don't live long enough to see and understand what happened in the beginning, what will happen in the future. We just, it's a long movie and we are coming in the middle of the movie and, we're, and we don't have, you know, the information when we arrive unless we look at the script. The Torah is a script. You want to know what the movie is all about? Read the script. 
Whoever reads the script can figure out what will happen, what has happened. Approximately what will happen tomorrow. We don't know exactly, but we know approximately what will happen. Mashiach is coming. And we know what needs to happen before Mashiach comes. So we know approximately, the prophets told us, we read the script. But whoever just arrives in the middle of a movie and does not read the script, he's going to have a hard time figuring out, what, what does Hashem want, of, want, of, want from me? Why is this happening? Why did six million Jews lose their life? Where was God? How come He allowed this? Read the script. That's all. And you will be able to have a better understanding of why certain things happen. Another emphasis in this week's parasha is the emphasis that the Torah puts in strengthening the handing over of the tradition from generation to generation. In order for the, for the tradition to be handed over, it has to be safeguarded. There are several things that one has to be cautious about. Otherwise, it can get easily lost, misinterpreted, wrong translation. Uh, many things can go wrong with the Torah. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of being in a Bet Knesset and, hearing, a sef and he hearing the Sefer Torah being read on Shabbat and all of a sudden the one who's reading stops and he says, I can't go on. Why can't he go on? Either a letter is missing or there is a wrong letter or you can't figure out what letter it is. The Sefer Torah can be pursued just for one letter. Why? Why does one letter make a difference? The simple explanation is because today it's one letter, tomorrow it's another letter, a word, a sentence. And before you know it, in a couple of years you have a different Torah. There are many Sidurim, not Sefer Torah, but there are many Sidurim, Humashim books, that have so many mistakes. Some of them are even funny. They were never revised, they were never edited, and they're not caught sometimes. Sefer Torah, we cannot afford to allow one mistake, not even one letter, because this is our survival, this is our Torah. So therefore, it may, it, it's pasul even for one letter. You could change the translation of the word, sure. We don't therefore allow even one letter to be wrong. We want our tradition to go down intact, so we have to be makpid, and the integrity of the Torah. So therefore, the Torah wants to put an emphasis in this week's parasha. And what does it tell us? Lo tosifu velo tigre'u. There's a special commandment not to, add com not to add mitzvot, not to detract, not to take away. Who is this referring to? To all, the many, to all those groups in, in Jewry throughout history who have attempted to modify the Torah according to the times. This doesn't apply anymore. This is a primitive law, Hazrat Shalom. In the past, they used to make fire with stones. Today, you can turn on Halila the light on Shabbat because all it is is a flick of a button. This was primitive back then. Kosher laws, today we're, very, today we're pasteurizing everything. Everything is more, much, more, much more sanitary. It has nothing to do with that. Torah says, Lo tigre'u, Lo tosifu. You cannot take away this Torah is forever. This Torah was not meant to be changed. And there are groups like the conservative Jews who have taken that liberty to interpret the Torah according to the way they see it, according to the times. And we don't have that liberty, the Torah says. The Torah therefore puts that in very clearly, black and white. You cannot change it, forget about it. So what do the, what the, what the reform do to get around this? They say, oh, this was never given by God to begin with. It was a committee. Well, we, we're going to make another committee now. See, the reform does away with the whole thing. Conservatives have in some ways a bigger problem. They both have a lot of problems. Because the reform cannot deny something that we have believed in for so many years. We gave our lives for We all witnessed it. We would never have accepted it. Ata hor et aladat, the Torah says in this week's parasha. You were shown. It doesn't say atem ra'item. Ata, every one of us. It's speaking to us in the singular language. Ata hor eta, you were shown. It doesn't even say ra'ita. Hor eta, you were shown, you were demonstrated. You were convinced. And you can't be convinced today too. If you just look around and analyze what you've received, what your parents had, what your grandparents did. Be fair, honest. And you will believe in the, same, that in the same Torah that your parents and your grandparents believe. But obviously, all these groups, what they have in common is they try to justify their lifestyle. They want to have a, a certain lifestyle where they can allow themselves anything they want. And in order to allow all that, they have to deny what the Torah says. Torah forbids homosexuality. Very clearly, it's black and white. But those who espouse that will come up with all sorts of excuses. No, the Torah did not exactly mean that. What do you mean exactly? It's black and white. Ask anybody. Somebody who wants something for himself will do whatever he can to get away with it, to cover up, to deny. It's all tavot, it's all yetzer, no matter what name you give it. And there were many such groups in Jewish history, whether it was because they were scared of the goyim, whether they wanted to have equal rights. They tried to abolish certain mitzvot, get rid of it. That is the danger that exists in, at all times, and therefore the Torah takes these measures. Lo tigreu velo tosifu, you cannot change, you cannot amend no additional mitzvot to the Torah. What about those who are ashamed? Torah takes measures for them too. What are you ashamed of? On the contrary, 
be proud of this. This is your chokhmah. The nations in the world will admire you when they see how intelligent you are, what kind of laws you have that guide your life. There's nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. Be proud of the Torah, not ashamed of it. Another emphasis to safeguard our tradition is bam. Torah says, do not intermarry, because you will assimilate. As Golda Meir said, we've lost more Jews through assimilation than through all the wars, even though she may have meant the recent wars, but it's still a, a, a very large number of Jews who have uh, disappeared in a sense because of assimilation. You can't marry a non-Jew. And what we said before, the Torah safeguards our tradition by reminding us that we witnessed it, we saw it, it wasn't handed down to us by a committee. Another important point. And then finally, later on in Pashat Kitavo, we will see the Tochecha, we will see the Brachot and the Klalot, the many blessings, or the opposite of the blessings, the curses. What's all that for? This is what will happen to you if you follow the Torah. This is what will happen to you if you do not follow. The Torah is warning us in advance. So in, in, in case it eventually does happen that we experience all these klalot, we should be able to know not only why this is happening, but the Torah is for real. And everything that the Torah said has happened. So what, what do we see from this? That the Torah has proven itself to be true through the fulfillment of the Berachot or Khalilah de Kelalot. So all of this information in advance, whether it's in the Torah or in the Prophets, is further to to reinforce that what Hashem promised will take place. It's for real, it's true. It's Min Hashemayim, not made up by a human being like Moshe. Moshe could not have foreseen all of that and said, this is what will happen. What, does he control nature? Does he control the weather? You'll have no rain. If you don't do the Shemitah, you don't do this Mitzvah, no rain. Does he control the weather? No way. It has to be Min Omen Hashemayim. So if we see these things happen, we will be able to relate this to what we heard, to what we read, and we will see and we will remember Sheyesh Hashem Bashamayim. Yesh Din Veyesh Dayan. There is a judge. Another very important mitzvah towards the end of the parasha. Basita Hayashar Vatov. This is a very unique commandment, very different than all the other ones. It's not specific. It just tells us it just tells us to be straight, honest, and good. And the rabbis tell us what the Torah had in mind here is to do Lifnimi Shuratadin, to go above and beyond the letter of the law, as we would say in English. You may be right, but sometimes you need to give in to do Lifnimi Shuratadin just to settle this matter, not to be involved in a machloket, in an argument with your neighbor. You sometimes need to be lifni mishurat adin, beyond the letter of the law. Another idea behind these words is not to just do a mitzvah latzeti de chova, just your bare minimum. Don't do just your bare minimum to do the mitzvah. Do more than that. I'm going to share with you two stories with the Chafetz Chaim that describe a little bit what this idea of lifni mishurat adin means. The Chafetz Chaim inherited a little bit of money from one of his aunts and they were struggling, him, him, him and his family. But with, together with this little bit of money, he was able to open up a grocery store, which his wife ran. And he, from time to time, would come in and help her. The word spread that the Hafez Chaim comes to the store once in a while. So everybody ran to buy from him. When he saw that he was Baruch Hashem making good parnasa, he told his wife, you're going to close early now. Why should we close early? I don't want to take Parnassah away from all the other grocery stores. Everybody's going to come by from us, right? So instead of being open till 5 or 6, let's say, he closed at 1. As soon as he had enough for the day, as soon as he had enough for the week, that's it, he didn't have to work anymore. He was sensitive to others. Did he have to do this according to the Allah? No. What, was he, what he was doing was lifni meshurat adin, going beyond the letter of the law. Another example of the Hafez Chaim, one day somebody bought some herring at this grocery shop. And the guy paid for the money and walked out without taking his bag. I'm sure this has happened to some of you too. You know, you go in, you forget. And sometimes they run after you. Sir, you forgot. That's exactly what happened. The man forgot his herring, but as soon as the Hafez Chaim went looking for him, he didn't see him. He disappeared. What does the Hafez Chaim do? He decides the next day, a free herring to any customer that comes through the shop. Everybody gets one free herring. He figured in this way, that customer would probably come by and eventually get back his herring. Did he have to do it? No. Now, this is a very important point of Nimeshurat Adin because the rabbis tell us the second temple was destroyed for some very, very uh, strange reason. It says, Al Shedanu Din Torah. They judged everybody according to the Din of Torah. The judges sat down, and when they had a case, they went according to the Din of Torah. What's wrong with that? Reuven and Shimon have an argument. They came, they looked up the halacha in the Shulchan Aruch, and they said, Reuven is right, Shimon is wrong. They did it according to the halacha, Din Torah. No, the second Beta Mikdash was destroyed, and this is very timely because we, we unfortunately, we're, we just mourned the, the destruction of both temples. It was destroyed because they danu din Torah. What's wrong with that? So the rabbis explain, if Reuven and Shimon come, 
and have a case. And Rivon comes out winning and Shimon comes losing. You know what remains after this Din Torah? Enmity, hatred between these two. So what if you said what the Lacha was? These two will remain enemies. Where is the shalom and the hava, the love and the peace that has to exist amongst Jews? The rabbis, the judges in those days, because they insisted on doing what the Torah says and they did not look for ways to make compromise, as we would call it today, let's settle out of court. Let there be peace. Let's give in a little bit. But let there be no machloket. They didn't look for that. They didn't even attempt this. That is what the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. That is one of the symptoms of Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred. When you don't want to talk to the guy, you don't want to have anything to do with him. The Chachamim had opportunities to make shalom, and they didn't. They chose to go by the strict letter of the law. And because of that, unfortunately, the temple was destroyed. But the question is, why did Am Yisrael suffer so much during the Second Temple era and after? I'm going to share with you a quick story of a description of how terrible things were back then. Nagdimon ben Gurion was a very wealthy man. And during the time of the Second Temple era, there was a tremendous amount of famine. There was so much famine that this man's daughter, he was a rich man, went around looking for food. Where did she look for food? In the manure of animals, looking for barley seeds, that she can collect a few barley seeds from the manure of the animals. Here and there she finds some barley seeds in the manure. You know how degrading that is? And the question is, how come Hashem made it so difficult for Israel? That's very, very degrading, it's so difficult. I mean, you want to punish the people, fine, but so degrading, why so much? So you will be reading in the Haftarah this week that Amisar suffered kiflaim, lakta kiflaim, as the Navi says, the Prophet says, ki ki Hashem kiflaim bechol we, we receive double the punishment that we deserve. Why? Why double? Hashem should have just given us what we deserve. No, we, got, we ended up getting double what we deserved. We suffered so much. Why? Anybody know here who gets double punishment? In the, according to the Torah, who, whose penalty is to pay double? A thief, a ganav. Ganav stole something, if he didn't return it on his own and he's caught, his penalty, his punishment, is you pay double. The penalty for paying double is for not admitting. Am Yisrael paid double because they did not admit that they were wrong. They did not do teshuvah. Had they admitted, no, we're wrong, we're sorry, it's our fault, they would not have suffered so much. Hashem allowed them to suffer so much because they did not admit it. That's the simple explanation. The Malvim, however, says, there is much more to the kiflaim than just not admitting. Malbim says the reason Amisha suffered so much is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to shorten the galut. And when you, in order to shorten the diaspora, you need to increase the suffering to atone. And that's why we have suffered so much. But wait a minute, then how come Hashem hasn't come earlier? If the whole idea of all this pain and suffering was to shorten the galut, we haven't seen any shortening. On the contrary, it's, it's, it's taken long and long and long. And we're almost by the year 6,000. So why has it been so painful? Why hasn't the Galut been shortened? And the explanation for this is as follows. We said in the very beginning that Am Yisrael was a chosen nation. We became an Am Segula. The meaning of Am Segula, which I did not explain before, and I, I will add, is a nation which is above the Mazal. We're so unique and so special, so important to Hashem, that Kadosh Baruch put us above the Mazal. What that means is that all the laws of nature that affect all races and all nations in the world will not affect us. All the nations in the world that existed before us disappeared. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, you heard of, you heard of a Babylonian recently? The old Egyptians, the Egyptians are not the same. They all disappeared because they are controlled by Mazal. We are above the Mazal. We are Am Segula. Hashem put us above the Mazal. And since Hashem put us above the Mazal, when we sin, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to take us down all the way to the bottom. He cannot destroy us because He already promised He will not destroy us. He made a covenant with us and He's keeping His promise. But He has to take us all the way down to the bottom. What will happen when He takes us down all the way to the bottom? People, nations of the world will be surprised. Why are they suffering so much? What's wrong with them? Going down to all the way to the bottom, to that extreme, is supposed to awaken us. This is incredible. This is strange. We are suffering more than anybody else. Some people haven't gotten the message. They try to run away from it. But in the end, the Torah says that we will get the message. When we're all the way at the bottom, the nations of the world will look at us and say, there's something wrong with you, you know? <laughs> no other nation is suffering as much as you. What is it? And hopefully that will make us come to that awareness that we've done something wrong. And in, 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 the, in, another, in another way of looking at it, because we have so much reward coming to us, so much blessing coming to us, if we fulfill the mitzvot, the opposite is also true. If we don't, Halila, fulfill the Torah mitzvot, we will suffer the consequences. That's what the kilalot 
are all about, which we'll, we'll be reading about in a couple of weeks from now. But ultimately, the increase in pain and suffering really has to do much more with the kapara than anything else. Ultimately, all of this is for our good. It atones, it cleanses us, and even though we've suffered much more than what we had to, in the end, we will see, when Mashiach comes, we will be able to see the benefit of all that pain. That is why we will be reading in the Aftarah, Nahamu, Nahamu Ami. Nahamu, Nahamu, that's also double. Because we suffer double, the Nechama will also be double. But the Nechama will be much more than double, much more than triple, much more than a thousand times. We have no idea how great the consolation will be. It will be for eternity. Because of all that we suffered, Az Yimales Chok Pinu. Then we will rejoice. Our mouth will be filled with, fla with laughter. Now we're crying. We don't understand why so much pain. But in the end, we will realize that it's for our good. But how could, how could anybody comfort us? We've, we've been slaughtered. We've been butchered. Millions of Jews lost their lives. Can anybody ever give us proper consolation? The answer is yes, Hashem can. Because when you comfort somebody because he lost someone, you cannot fully comfort him. Why? Because you cannot bring back the dead person. Hashem will be bringing back all those who have lost their lives, all those who have been eaten by sharks in the sea, all those who have been burnt alive, whose ashes remain in the camps. They will be all coming back. That is why Hashem's Nechama could be a true Nechama. And that's why it's a Nechama Kefula, because it's for eternity. I'd like to just finish, since we're talking about the redemption, just like to add that the redemption is compared to a woman who is pregnant, as you will see in the Aftarah. Because the Galut is compared to a woman who is childless, Hazrat Shalom. A woman who is childless gives up hope. She thinks she'll never have children. The Geula will be a woman who is already pregnant, who is already looking forward to something. And the Geula, this redemption will also happen very, very sudden. Beterem tahil yalada. Before she's about to get ready, she's already giving birth. The water will break. Before she knows it, she's giving birth. It will happen so sudden. People will not realize she was pregnant. There are some women that you don't know they're pregnant even in their fifth or sixth month. They're so skinny. They're flat. It will happen so sudden. The Geula will be like a pregnancy. And we see it today. What kind of a pregnancy? More Jews coming to Eretz Israel. The land growing and being developed. All of that is a description of the pregnancy. The prophet ends by saying, Tzion b'mishpat yipadeh b'shaveh b'tzedakah. Tzion will be redeemed through mishpat, through justice, and through charity. What does that mean? It will be redeemed through justice, through all the pain and suffering. That is justice. That will help us with the Geula, with the quick redemption. But also, let's not forget the second part. V'shaveh b'tzedakah. For those of us who are, Zat Hashem, going to witness all of this, if we want to see it, we want to live through it, we need to participate in tzedakah. Tzion b'mishpat tepadeh v'shaveh b'tzedakah.